Thank you, Andy, and thank you, everyone, for attending this session and for giving me the opportunity to show you the work that we have done at the University of Illinois with the assembly of nine insect genomes. Um, during my talk, I'm going to particularly focus on the contributions of the TELSIC libraries to these assemblies. During my talk, um, I am first going to give you an overview of the DNA sequencing facility at the University of Illinois to put my talk in perspective and so that you um, understand why am I talking to this uh, about this. Um, then I will talk about the relevance of this work involving the assembly of insect genomes, and then we'll go over uh, methods, uh, results, and conclusions. Regarding the DNA sequencing facility, we are, um, we are a service facility. We are 12 research uh, specialists dedicated to user support, to DNA and RNA quality control, to making libraries and doing sequencing, troubleshooting, and offering further support. So we are pure service facility. Um, we have all the latest uh, instrumentation for next generation sequencing, including two Nova 6. These instruments give us a massive sequencing capacity for anything that needs, you know, either has a very large number of samples or needs a very high uh, sequencing depth, such as genome resequencing, RNA seq or differential gene expression, methylation, uh, exome sequencing, or any other cap any other application that needs very high depth. Not all projects need um, millions of reads. So for those projects such as sequencing of um, small bacterial genomes or viral genomes or amplicons, we, we use um, 3 my seq For long read sequencing, we have a PacBio SQL 2E, and we also have an Oxford Nanopore uh, grid ion. And we also have quite, quite a bit of uh, robotic automation for preparation of library prep in, um, in a high throughput manner. Uh, so what type of work do we do with all these instruments? Um, we serve the, the needs of all the uh, University of Illinois campuses, but um, many of our users are also from academic institutions, private companies, and federal agencies across the United States. And actually, a significant portion of our funding comes from researchers from other countries. And we have users in South America, in Europe, in Middle East, Middle East and, and in Asia. So this wide user base um, means that we get to process all types of samples from innumerable plants, animals, and microbial communities, and, 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 and microbes. Um, as a result, a significant portion of the work that we do is in non-model species. Um, many of these species have no reference genome, and we are contacted to perform the novo genome assembly um, and for building the genomic resources and for all the applications that come later, such as genome resequencing, differential gene expression, and others. So we have a lot of experience in the novo genome assembly. The goal of this particular project is to contribute to the Earth Biogenome Project. So the Earth Biogenome Project aims to sequence all the eukaryotic species on Earth. And, um, and so the, the idea is to contribute to this project by sequencing all the insect species from Illinois. And you may not think of Illinois as, uh, you know, the Amazon as a source of, uh, you know, enormous source of biodiversity. However, in Illinois, there are over 3,500 insect species. So we have plenty of diversity in, in insects. Um, the researchers that developed the vision for this work and received the funding for the, fi for the pilot project are uh, Jean Robinson, Chris Dietrich, and Jeffrey Stein, the are professors at the University of Illinois. All the bioinformatics work that I'm going to show and a lot more uh, that was done to, to get really great assemblies that I'm, that I'm not going to have time to show was done by Chris Fields, Kim Walden, and Gloria Rendon from our biotech center. Um, Kim Walden particularly has exp um, over a decade of experience doing the novel assembly on insect genomes, so her expertise was critical for this project. And my lab uh, was responsible for DNA extraction, um, library prep, uh, and sequencing. So why insects? Insects are over half of all the eukaryotic species. So it's a really rich um, uh, film, film. It's a very diverse film. Um, the insects involve you know, either uh, pests or disease vectors or pollinators or, or insects that actually recycle nu nutrients. So they are really important um, in our ecosystem. The insects using this study 
were captured in central Illinois. And you can see that we captured insects from different ecosystems, and they were captured by vacuuming, by sweeping, and also using lights at night to capture uh, nocturnal um, insects. The insects were brought back to the lab um, alive. They were classified that they were put in, in vials and immediately frozen and at minus 80. We did some preliminary studies showing that the, the best way to get high molecular weight DNA was to freeze them right away after capture. Um, then, then you know, uh, some duplicated insects were added to, to the collection. So the species that were selected for this particular project represent six different orders, eight families. Some of them are predators or parasitoids or herbivores. But the important thing is that none of them had any genome information. So um, some of them have very little DNA sequencing, but no genome information previously available. These are the insects that, that were selected for this project. We call them EB1 to EB31. So this is Earth Biogenome 1 to 31. Here is the order, here is the family. And here you can see um, you know, big pictures of these uh, insects. You can see, um, one of the things you can see, by, these pictures are not at, at scale. So some of these insects are really tiny, such as this one and, and EB27, and some others are, are really large. But you can, one thing you can see is that the diversity on the amount of DNA that we will have available per, per insect, and also the amount of pigments. Um, these pigments sometimes stain the DNA, and pigments can inhibit downstream reactions and can really affect the efficiency of sequencing. So it's extremely important to develop a method that really cleans up the DNA so that there are no problems um, downstream. Um, so this you know, diversity of, of, of you know, morphologies and, and pigmentation presents a lot of uh, challenges. In addition to this, um, insect genomes are particularly difficult to, to assemble. Um, for example, closely related species may have widely different genome sizes and features. And um, what you learn from one species may not apply to a, to a similar, to a closely related species because may, they may have a completely different number of um, transposons. They may have transposon insertions from horizontal gene, horizontal, horizontal gene transfer. They may have, um, you know, long telomeres or, or incorporation of um, mitochondrial genes into the nuclear genome or, you know, many, many differences. So you can never um, guess the genome size uh, of, of an insect just looking at the genome size of a closely related species. Another thing that is very variable, so it is, of course, the, the repeat content is highly variable among different taxa. And the other thing is heterozygosity. These are wild-caught individuals, and, um, and genome, insect genomes are known for, for having very high heterozygosity. So a lot of challenges here. And uh, now that, that we have insects, we need to extract the DNA. And here I can show you an overview of the methods that we use. First, we extracted DNA. And the idea is because of the heterozygosity, we wanted to do uh, the, the most we cut for the, the majority of the libraries from only one insect. So we extracted DNA. Then we made a TELSIC libraries. TELSIC libraries were used to estimate the genome size and also for scaffolding of the pack bio assembly. Then we made a pack bio library, either HiFi, Ultra Low, or CLR. And then we also made um, high C uh, libraries. So we bought the, the Omni C kit from Dog Tail Genomics. They, they, they trained us how to make the libraries ourselves in our lab. And, um, and these are the high C libraries that we used for scaffolding. Um, so the, the assemblies were based on, on pack bio sequences. We made a um, pack bio assembly. Then we scaffolded the pack bio assembly with TELSIC libraries. And then we further scaffolded it with the with the high C libraries. Once we had a final assembly, we did the gap filling um, with the Telsic using the Telsic reads, and there was a lot of QC done on the on the on the final assembly. And we also extracted biological content also using the Telsic libraries. Um, so regarding the DNA extraction, let's go to DNA extraction now. If you want to use long reads, it is critical that the DNA is in long fragments. So ideally, you would have the DNA in fragments over 40 kb. Um, 
Another important thing is that the DNA must be clean. So the absorbance ratios should be 1.8 to 2. We see when the absorbance ratios are 1.2 or even lower, that DNA does not perform well. Uh, it really affects the efficiency of, of sequencing. Um, for PAC bio libraries, you need quite a bit of DNA. You need one to five micrograms, depending on the genome size and on how many smart cells you want to sequence. If the genomes are really small, so less than 500 megabases, then we can start a library with five nanograms of DNA. We can do an amplification of the DNA. Um, so for those, we need very little DNA, but the genome must be shorter than, than 500 megabases. For TELSIC libraries, one major advantage is that you need very little DNA. So depending on the genome size, you will use one to five nanograms of DNA. Um, specimen preservation was critical. So if we need to get high molecular weight DNA, the DNA has to be in, in long fragments. And we saw that um, if we put the insects in, in ethanol, for example, ethanol fragments the DNA and mix the DNA, we didn't have good results. If we try to put the insects on DNA stabilization solutions, the DNA was also fragmented. The only thing that really worked was to put the insects immediately, either on dry ice or, or, or in the freezer at minus 80 um, uh, alive. In a specimen, and I'm going to talk about this later in the presentation, specimens with large body sizes, it's really important to use only the head and torso and, and, and abo avoid the abdomen. Um, this, is, this is something that you can only do if the specimen is, is, is really large. Um, so regarding the method, it was a very simple method. We submerged a metal rack in liquid nitrogen. Then we did grinding of the specimen. We put the, you know, one insect in a, in a 1.5 mil cube, and then we grind the insect with a, with a disposable plastic pestle. We added CETA, incubated for some time. Then we added protein SK and RNAs, and we incubated overnight. We saw that this overnight incubation was really important to get cleaner DNA. Next day, we clean up with a chloroform and isoamyl alcohol. We run, and, and then we run it through the MAGATRAP kit. This is the kit that we use for most of our high molecular weight DNA extraction. It's bit based and we see that it really um, uh, keeps high molecular weight DNA, and we can wash out several contaminants during the, during the bead washing. Extremely important um, during the entire procedure is to use white ball pipette tips and to never vortex the DNA. So for example, when we do the cleanup with chloroform, uh, we just rock the tube from side to side very gently, and there's never a vortexing step. You have to maintain high molecular weight DNA. Um, how do we evaluate the integrity of the DNA? So you can either run them on a fragment analyzer or a fentopulse. When we did the study early this year, we didn't have a fentopulse. The fentopulse is more sensitive. It can evaluate more high molecular weight DNA. But we had a fragment analyzer, and the fragment analyzer can show clearly, for example, in this sample, that most of the DNA fragments are over 40 kb. So they are all 40 kb, there's minimal fragmentation, basically almost nothing under 40 kb. So this is excellent high molecular weight DNA. Here the peak is anywhere from 80 to 200 kb uh, fragments. In this other sample, for example, we see that there is um, you know, some high molecular weight DNA, but there is also a lot of fragmentation down to 1 kb. And one thing that we, we observe is that, um, that when the DNA is fragmented, is also nicked, and nicking is fatal for single molecule sequencing. So um, in this DNA, for example, there would be no point in trying to get long reads and using DNA that is completely fragmented. This is not a DNA that we would use. Um, we would go back to the lab and extract a new DNA. Um, in the insects, you know, that there was some variation in DNA quality. We had to accept in some insects some uh, fragmentation down to 10 kb, but, um, but nothing under 10 kb. Um, so now, this is the amount of DNA that we got from, um, from the different um, individuals. You can see that um, we got, for some of them, we got um, a few micrograms of DNA, so 3.6 micrograms, 6 micrograms from EB14. Remember EB14, because we will go back to this uh, two or three times in the presentation. We got only 0.3, um, uh, 300 nanograms. Here we got quite a bit of um, DNA, and from these two, EB27 and EB29, we got 18 nanograms 
and six nanograms. These were really tiny insects. And, um, and from this other one, 1 1.7 nanograms. So um, what is important is that we wanted to make the TELSIC libraries and the PacBio libraries from one individual. We did not want to mix individuals because then we had to deal with heterozygosity uh, during the assembly. So once we had the DNA, the next step is to make the TELSIC libraries, which we use for estimation of genome size and scaffolding of the PacBio assembly. Um, the TELSIC libraries are linked long reads that are sequenced with short reads. And you can see here there was a paper published in which they explain in detail uh, how the libraries work, and they show several examples where they assemble microbial genomes and human genomes. So I encourage you to go to that paper and, and, and learn more about the libraries. And basically, it's important to start with um, fragments at least 20 KB. The reason for that, you have to think that PacBio will give you reads that are 10 to 20 KB. So if you want the TELSIC libraries to make a significant contribution for the, uh, for the scaffolding, the DNA should be longer than, than that. So the DNA has to be as long as possible. Um, the next step is to insert transposons to each fragment. And here, for example, you have here the pictorial view. Here you have a fragment of DNA, let's say at least 40 KB. And, and then we add transposons in a ratio, depending on the genome size and the amount of DNA that we have, we add transposons so that, that the transposons will end up being spaced several hundreds of base pairs apart, anywhere from 100 to three or 400 base pairs apart. So each fragment will have several transposons. The next step is to add the tail beads. And the tail beads is a bead that has um, hundreds of thousands of uh, oligos. And these oligos have a barcode. So each bead has one barcode sequence. It has uh, thousands of oligos, but one barcode sequence. And the transposons are um, annealed to this barcode. So each fragment of DNA will go to one tail bead. One tail bead can capture anywhere from four to eight uh, different fragments. Um, but because DNA is super cold, you expect that the entire DNA and uh, DNA fragment will anneal to, to one bead. So the next step is to add another transposon that will fragment the DNA in between two transposons. Um, and then because this transposon, the, the green transposon and the, the red transposons have different, um, let's say, um, oligo sequences, then we can do a PCR amplification that will amplify this DNA fragment in between the transposons. So now, and then we sequence the library in, in the Illumina NovaSeq. So now what we have, and this is what, what, what you have, the way you have to think about it, is that we started with an entire genome, but now we, we bin this genome into several, into millions of baskets. Now what we have to do, instead of assembling the entire genome, you just have, we just have to assemble this fragment, these 20, 40 KB fragments, 60 KB fragments, using the barcode information. So first we assemble this, long fragments, and then we, we can do the, the genome assembly using the long, long linked reads. Um, of course, if that 40 KB fragment has regions of long repeats or very low diversity, this is based on, on short reads. So some of them may not assemble well, but, um, but the idea is that many of them will assemble um, entirely. So now we have and so the, regarding the method used to, to, to make the TELSIC libraries, the important thing to, to the take home message is that they are really easy to make. What you do is you put one to five nanograms of DNA in a tube, then you add a reagent, then you add the tail bits, and then you add another reagent to the same tube. That takes about one hour. Then you wash the bits, then you add the reagents for the PCR amplification, you do the PCR, and then you clean up the libraries. That's it, so it's all done in one tube, and then you QC the libraries. So it's, it's all done in one tube. It is quick and easy. There is no mystery about it. You don't need any special equipment. Um, you can train anyone you know, in, in, in minutes. Um, regarding the amount of DNA, that will depend on, on the genome size. For example, a small genome, 100 megabases, you would use one nanogram. A, a human-sized genome, you would use three to five nanograms. Um, you have to dilute it to, to one nanogram per microliter accurately. That's where we spend most of our time trying to get that, that DNA to one nanogram per microliter. Sometimes we have 1.3 nanograms per microliter. We dilute it a little bit and we go to 0.8 and so on and so forth. So it's, it's very important to, to, 
to start with a very accurate uh, uh, dilution of the DNA. Once we make the library, we'll run it in the fragment analyzer, and this is the profile that we get. So most fragments are anywhere from, library fragments are anywhere from 300 to, to 1 KB. Uh, once you remove the adapter, so this means that the fragments are 100 to, to 400 bases or so. Um, this is how the library looks like. This is the structure of the library. So you have the P5 adapter. This is what adheres to the flow cell. This is the library index. So if you have six different samples, each sample will have a different index. So you can pull them all and sequence them on one lane in the Nova Seek. Um, so sequencing starts with read one, and read one starts with a fragment with the DNA fragments. Um, then the second in the second read will be the DNA barcode. This is the Telsic barcode. So this barcode it tells which you know which fragment this belongs to. Um, then you can reconstruct that that, that um, original fragment by by looking at you know other sequences that have the same barcode. So you do read one, which is the DNA. Then you read the barcode. Then you read the library index, so you know which sample you are sequencing, and then you sequence uh, read two. So the, the, the same DNA fragment from the other end. And for those of you that know how to run the, the multiplexing pipeline. This is how you put it in the machine. You say, I want a read one. I want another read that has the barcode. I want um, the, uh, the index for the multiplexing, and I want uh, read two. So the really important thing to see in this picture is that read one and read two are shotgun reads. They don't have any other information that you have to know or, or remove. They are simply shotgun reads. Um, so they, you can make link reads when you use the, the barcode read. But the read one and read two are just shotguns. Um, so what are TELSIC libraries used for? They are used for um, estimation of genome size and genome features. We will see that in my presentation. They are used for scaffolding of an existing assembly. They can be used also for gap filling of a scaffolding assembly. We, we did that. You can also use them by themselves for de novo assembly with a supernova software that was developed for the Ternex Genomics libraries. Those, those of you that have been doing the Nova assembly know that there were very similar libraries from Ternex Genomics that were discontinued. And the Telsic libraries to cover, you know, they are very similar. They work in a similar way. And you can use the same software to do the Nova assembly and with these libraries. And because they are shotgun reads, you can also use them for error correction of Oxford Nanopore reads and PAC bio CLR, so two types of reads that have a high error rate and need to be error corrected, you can use the TELSIC uh, reads. The sequencing depth is um, you need to sequence to about a 15x of the haploid genome for estimation of genome size, uh, 30x for scaffolding. And if you want to do the novo assembly um, um, with, the, with the libraries themselves, then you need to sequence them to 100x. So how did we do the, um, the estimation of genome size? So we did made the libraries, sequence the libraries, then we um, input the, um, the, the read one and read two into this software Jellyfish. Jellyfish will count the KMERS in read one and read two, and we generate a histogram of a KMER distribution. And then we load this histogram into GenomeScope, which is a website where you can just enter the, the histogram, and it will give you this curve. So this is EB29. This was a haploid mail. Here, for example, you know, the jellyfish first um, um, takes the read one and read two, and it will break them up into substrings of 21 bases, and it counts the number of times that, that each string is present. So here you have the, you know, the, the distribution that you get from KMER counting, nice distribution. Here you have a lot of KMER that are very abundant, but they are present only once. And if they are present only once, chances are they are coming from sequencing errors. So this is usually sequencing errors. These are um, these are just the, the you know the KMERS present in the genome, and with this information, the software can calculate the genome size. So here, for example, this is a genome about 134 megabases, and you can see here that it has a very low level of heterozygosity. This is EB29, which is okay. It shows two humps, and what you can see here is these are the KMERS. These are KMERS that are present in only one of the chromosomes. Um, they are they're observed um, only once, so in only one of the chromosomes. Here, there are KMERS that are present in both chromosomes. So what you are seeing here is heterozygosity. 
So here, for example, this is a genome size. It calculated a genome size of about 275 megabases. And you can see that the heterozygosity is much higher than in this one, because this one was a haploid, so there was no, no heterozygosity. So what this shows you is the importance of using only one insect for sequencing um, or you know, sequencing the genome. Um, this heterozygosity is, is normal in insects, so we don't see anything weird here. If we see other bumps in here, that could be due to maybe contaminants or could be due to very long rapids or very abundant rapids or something like that. But this, there is nothing, that, you know, red flags in this genome. However, here we have EB14, which we call the ugly. And the ugly, you can see that there is no curve. Here, something happened that the software was not able to converge and, 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 and produce a curve. Um, you can see that the estimate of genome size was 1.7 to 3.7, so a very wide range, something strange, and heterozygosity also doesn't make sense. So um, when we see this, we, you know, it can still be assembled, of course, if you throw a lot of you know, libraries and money into it. But the cost of assembling this genome was outside of the scope of the pilot project, so we dropped it from the, um, from the project. However, I will show later we did an assembly with the tel rates alone, and we got very interesting data that explains why we were not able to get um, a good uh, fit in, in, this, uh, in this genome. So um, now we have to make, so this is the, est the estimation of genome sizes that we got from the EB1 to EB31. So genome sizes were 360 megabases, 1.6 gigabase. Here EB14, we dropped it. So the, the, you know, so it doesn't really matter, but um, the others were one gigabase. And these two, you remember that these two were really tiny insects that we only got a few nanograms of DNA. Well, unfortunately, the genome sizes are very small. And um, so we can still sequence this. So we got the TELSIC libraries, we calculated the genome sizes. Now we can determine, okay, how much, um, how much sequencing do we need to do? Now we can, we can budget, we can see how much you know, how many libraries we need to make and how many smart cells we need to sequence. So now we go to the PacBio libraries. And the, we made three types of PacBio libraries. The first one, HiFi. HiFi libraries need a minimum of one microgram of DNA. The DNA has to be long because you want long reads. And they are sequenced to a minimum depth of 20x. And each fragment is sequenced several times. Um, so it produces, and, and every time it will correct the errors from the previous pass. So it produces error-corrected data, and it really takes a few hours to assemble. Then the ultra-low, remember those two insects that had only a few nanograms of DNA, but the genome sizes were very small. So we can, do, we can prepare these ultra-low libraries. We only need five nanograms of DNA, and we had five nanograms in those both, both insects. Um, and the genome sizes were very small. It only works for small genomes. And the risk, because you know it's based on amplification, on PCR amplification, the reads are usually anywhere from 5 kb to 12 kb. And they are sequenced as high fi so the reads are also error corrected. They are ready for assembly. In one of them, one of them had an estimated genome size of 1.7 to 3.2 um, gigabases. And we decided to make a CLR library. CLR libraries have much longer fragments, but their reads are not error corrected. So you have to uh, do error correction, and we can do that with TELSIC. Um, so it's a different type of library. So based on, on the information that we had, you know, we, we know the DNA yields that we have. We have the genome estimated genome size. Now we, we budgeted, okay, how many, what type of libraries are we going to make? And how many uh, smart cells are we going to sequence from each one? We have the TELSIC, we have the PacBio, now we go to the Omni-C libraries. And the Omni-C libraries are, um, it's a technique that cross-links the chromatin in the tissue. So you don't, you don't, you don't extract DNA, you just use tissue, you cross-link the, 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 the chromatin and you keep the 3D structure of the, of, the, of, the, of the chromatin. So it introduces bonds that freeze interactions between regions in the same chromosome. And these interactions, they might be a few thousands of bases um, apart or maybe millions of bases apart. So it can give you really very long range information um, about the genome. Then you cut the, um, the, you know, you cut the DNA with uh, um, endonucleases. This Omni-C, they use sequence independence endonucleases. So it's a, it's a 
is an improvement of previous high C libraries. And, and then you, ligate, you perform a ligation that favors fragments that were interacting versus fragments that were not uh, cross-linked. So we may, the thing with these libraries is that you need 20 milligrams of tissue um, for high library complexity. And ideally, you would use one specimen to avoid you know, heterozygosity. If you have small insects, you need to collect several insects from the same location, hoping, hoping that they come from the same family or the same colony. But that, um, that you know, then you are going to have to deal with heterozygosity later. So we were able to make only C libraries from most of them. This one, um, EB29, was so small that there was no way we could do we could make libraries. Now, for most of the insects, we only had one more um, one more individual. And so we, and for many of them, we did not have 20 milligrams. So for many of them, we made libraries without the ideal conditions. So if the Omni C library didn't work well, it's not because the Omni C library didn't work. It's because we didn't have the ideal conditions to to prepare them. But we wanted to go ahead anyway to, you know, as a proof of concept of how many insects do we need, you know, how, what are the ideal conditions to produce a good assembly. So. Um, now we have the TLC, we have the Parvalio, we have the, the OmniC, we sequence everything, and now we have to assemble them. Um, so the assembly started with the PacBio Hi-Fi libraries. Um, we did a raw assembly using Hi-Fi ASM, Hi-Fi ISM. Then the next step was uh, porching duplicates and porching um, haplotypes, and then we did um, scaffolding with the TLC grids using links and arcs. Next step is to do scaffolding using ARIMA and SALSA with the OMNI-C libraries. And then there is a lot of QC that is done. First, we did um, gap filling with the TELSIC reads using sealer, and then um, block tools and repeat masker and mitofinder. This was very important because looking at the mitochondrial genome, we were able to, to reclassify some of the insects. Um, so a lot of QC was done that I won't have time to show in this presentation. So now let's look at the results of the uh, of the uh, um, of the sequencing and the assembly. First of all, our first question was, what are the, the the genome sizes? And here we have in blue the actual genome size. When we did the assembly, this is the actual genome size. And in orange, they estimate the genome size from the Telsic libraries when we put them in Jellyfish and Genome Scope. The um, the gray is another software that we use, but let's just focus on blue and orange. You can see here it was right in the spot. Here it was a little bit off, but nothing too bad. EB14, it was off, and you will see why. I mean, this is the one that we couldn't uh, assemble, but we, we didn't even try to assemble. Uh, EB15 was very close, 17 very close, 19 very close. EB20 was the CLR library, and it was a little bit off, but um, but that has more to do with it. We haven't used a CLR library. And EB27, 29, and 31 were very close. So the majority of them, the, the, the assemblies that work well, um, the, the, estimate on, the estimation of genome size was very close to the actual genome size. That was a really great uh, finding. And here, this is the assembly metric. So here we have um, uh, some of the most important uh, uh, data. I know this table has a lot of numbers, but let me walk you through it. So here we have the insects, EB1, EB5, EB15. Here we have the numbers from the pack bio assembly. Then we added the TELSIC and the, uh, for uh, scaffolding, and then we added the OMNI-C. Here we have the number of scaffolds, the total size of scaffolds, which is the genome size, long scaffold, short scaffold, and this is the most important one, the N50 scaffold length. So in EP1, for example, you can see when we did the assembly with pack bio, we got scaffold lengths of eight megabases. In general, anyway, anything that is over one megabase, um, you know, we are really happy. But this one was, you know, was a very good um, uh, assembly to start with. And then when we added the TELSIC, we almost got a, 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 you know, a twice as long scaffold length. So the, the, the TELSIC uh, worked really well for that. The OMNI-C made a, a, a small contribution. But remember, this is not the fault of the OMNI-C. It's the fault that we made the libraries with only one insect. And many times, we did not have the amount of, of um, tissue that is needed to make these libraries. EB5, from the beginning, we had an excellent assembly. So the TELSIC and the OMNI-C made um, a very um, 
little uh, contributions. And also some of the, um, the Telsic libraries, you know, for some of them, we did have some fragmentation of the DNA. So some of them, you know, they didn't have a lot of fragments over 20 KB. So the um, so that's something also to take into account. EB15, for example, the Telsic libraries duplicated the, 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 the size of the scaffolds. And the omni -C libraries made a huge, um, uh, you know, in, increase in scaffolding 50 and also on the longest scaffold. EP17 is another one that made a significant, the, the Telsic library made a significant contribution and the, and the omni -C library uh, added more, um, you know, more, more um, longer scaffold and much longer, the, the longest scaffold was also much, much longer. EB19, again, the Telsic library uh, produced almost three times as long um, N50 scaffold. And the Omnic library produced very likely, this is very likely a chromosome. Um, so it made a, a significant contribution. Now I'm going to show the same table, but I'm going to add one column. So don't get um, scared by the numbers. I added one column here, the Busco scores. We compare our assembly against a set of almost 1,400 conserved genes that are supposed to be in most eukaryotes. And we can see here, what we can see here is that 98% um, that of these genes were present in our assembly. In most cases, they were present in single copy. Duplications were very low. And in most cases, the genes were complete. They had no fragmentation. So, um, so this means that our assemblies have a really great assembly of the gene space. Um, all these genes that we were looking for are there, they are in single copy and they are not fragmented. So, and, and that also means, and the, the point I'm going to make here is that when we added the, the Telsic libraries and then the OMIC library, we did not break the gene space. So that was for five of the insects. This is the other four insects. EB, EB20 is the insect that where we used CLR libraries. And you remember that the estimated genome size was 1.7 to 3.2. It ended up being lower, and the assembly is definitely not that good. Um, it's um, you know, lots of scaffolds, and the scaffolding 50 is not really high. Um, it took an enormous amount of time computationally to get the assembly because of the high error rate and because of the, uh, the error correction. So what we learn here is next time, if we have a, a genome size you know, estimated between 1.7 and 3.2, we will do HiFi. HiFi works, and CLR is, is extremely computationally intensive. Um, and, and it didn't work that well. EP27 was another one in which the Telsic libraries made a major contribution and the omni -C libraries added more to, to the assembly. EP29 was, the insect was so small that we could not make an omni -C library. But you can see here that the Telsic library made a major contribution. So eight times longer scaffold and length and the, the longest scaffold was much longer also. So that when you when all you have is a tel sick, then that's that's the way to go. Um, and EP31 is another one in which both the tel sick and the and the omni -C libraries made significant contributions. And again, I'm going to show the same table with the Busco scores, and you can see the CLR. Um, we the, we are missing several genes in there, but the others are really a um, great assembly of the gene space with no fragmentation. So this is regarding the assembly metric. Now let's look at some of the QC of the assembly. And here, for example, we have EB5. Here, what we do is um, we blasted the, the, the scaffolds to the um, Uniref Pro database uh, for classification you know, of taxa, what, what, is, what is in our assembly. And we also um, um, aligned the Telsic reads to look for statistical significance. And we can see here, for example, that all the scaffolds, basically, the majority of the scaffolds, um, blast to arthropod. So the dark red is arthropod. And so they, this is really, I mean, the, the, the core insect genome is all arthropod. And here there is an outlier that aligns to bacteria. And uh, this is very likely an endosymbion. This is very common in insects to have endosymbions. And with the Telsic libraries, we can see that the reads are, you know, in sufficient depth that this is real. This is not just a spurious um, um, artifact. This is real. This exists. So we were able to identify an endosymbion. That, that's really great. Now you remember the ugly. Um, in the ugly, what we did, we did not make any PacBi or IC library, but we did assembly of the genome using supernova. It took forever. It took over three weeks. And we got, of course, a, a really bad assembly, very fragmented assembly. And the reason for that 
is this, that when we align the, um, the, 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 the scaffolds to, to, to the database, we get here in that red, uh, again, arthropod, but about one third or maybe almost one, five, one half of the reads are something else. And this something else is bacteria, fungi, plant, and nematodes. So this is a herbivore and it's, you know, it's feeding on the plant and whatever else is on the plant. And, um, and so it's, everything is showing. It's a very small insect. Remember, it was only 300 nanograms. So it was very difficult to, you know, if we remove the abdomen, then we end up with almost, um, you know, no DNA. And, and this has a, a long genome size. So we can, you know, with this information, we can go back and we can remove the scaffolds that belong to these um, bacteria and plants. And we can also, using Kraken, we can remove the, the, the raw reads that align to, to bacteria and fungi, but there are still many reads that are unclassified and that still, you know, um, make the assembly difficult. So this would be an assembly that it probably can be done, but you have to throw a lot of resources into it. And also you will have to use many insects because the insect is very small. And that will further complicate the assembly because then you have to deal with heterozygosity. Um, we also wanted, you know, we do that after doing scaffolding, we do that, the, you know, to put two contexts together and there will be a gap in the middle. And so we wanted to fill the, that gap with um, with the telsic reads. We can use the telsic reads for those. And I wanted to see the telsic reads, you know, what's the coverage of telsic reads along the genome. And this is the uh, EB29 genome. We align the telsic reads to the genome, and we also align the raw hi-fi reads. And you can see that the entire genome is represented by telsic reads. There's no portion that is missing. When we look at a small um, at a small portion of the uh, you know the, this uh, alignment, you can see here you know peaks and valleys. This is very typical of libraries that come from PCR amplification. There are some biases, but at the end of the day, the entire uh, portion is covered by reads. So we can use telsic reads for gap filling, and we can also use them for error correction of a nanopore assembly or a, or a CLR assembly. Final considerations. Um, regarding the pilot project, we validated how insects could be preserved. We validated a method for high molecular weight DNA extraction. We validated construction of telsic libraries, PacBio and OmniC libraries. We also validated the workflow for genome assembly and QC. And remember, there was a lot more QC than what I am showing. Um, we saw that by getting the information from genome size and features, that really helped us to determine the sequencing depth and the effort expected for each genome. Um, we learned that next time we will only use HiFi libraries. We will not use CLR libraries because they really took you know, a lot more time to assemble that one than all the other genomes. Um, and we didn't get a good assembly. We know that we have to capture as many insects from the same area as possible. Um, mostly for OmniC libraries. And then if you have a small insect with a large genome, you will need a lot of uh, insects. And whenever possible, we know that we have to avoid using the abdomen. Regarding specifically the telsic libraries, um, we know that they require minimal, first of all, the major advantage is that they require minimal amounts of DNA. So we can make libraries from the same individual that is used to make the PAC bio libraries. So we don't have to deal with heterozygosity there. So the same individuals will do libraries and scaffolding. It's a very easy protocol. You don't need any special equipment, no microfluidic equipment. It has a very low cost. The cost in reagents per library is 100 to 200 dollars, depending on the genome size on how much DNA you have to use. The sequencing depth is, is low. You know, if you can put a lot of libraries in one S4 lane, so the cost of sequencing per sample is, is low. The evaluation of the, the genome size and genome features uh, was very important for us because it really allowed us to determine you know, how much budget and effort we have to put into assembly. It's the only scaffolding tool available when the amount of DNA or tissue is limited. That was the case in EB29. That's all we had for scaffolding, and it produced a significant uh, improvement of the assembly. Um, they, as you can show, then as I show in the data, there's many times when they are done in the, in the right conditions, they produce significant improvements in F50 uh, scaffold sizes. And also they um, allow for gap filling, so and gap filling and, 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 and also um, 
uh, error correction with highly accurate reads. So compared to, to you know, reads with high um, error rates. And they can also be used for the novel assembly by themselves if, if no other long reads are available. And my last slide is another example from, from a plant. We also assembled Melon, but in Melon we did something different. We made Telsic libraries and we did ParBio libraries. And we assembled the Telsic by themselves using Supernova. The Melon genome is about 440 megabases. And you can see with Telsic we assembled all, almost the entire genome. And, and the scaffold length was 3.5 megabases, so it was very decent. Of course, with PacBio, we got the entire genome, much longer scaffolds. And when we joined, when we scaffolded the PacBio assembly with Telsic, we got, we got much longer assemblies. But if for some reason, the only thing we had available was a little bit of DNA, we could have made the assembly with Telsic really quick, really easy, and we could have um, obtained a, a decent assembly. And with that, I wanted to thank, um, first of all, the PIs, you know, for their vision, the vision they have for the entire project, sequencing all the insects in Illinois. Um, my lab for the amazing work that they do for, you know, making the libraries and doing the, the sequencing and, and everything they do caring so much about quality. Um, the bioinformatics team and, and also the, the, the team that maintains all our sequencing and computing infrastructure. Um, the uh, Office of the uh, Vice Chancellor for Research, because they support our biotech center. And the funding for this pilot project came from the Illinois uh, Innovation Network. So thank you for the money. And now I'll be very happy to answer questions. Thank you, Alvaro. As a reminder to webinar participants, if you have a question, please type it into the Q&A box and if you haven't already, please take a moment to fill out our survey questions now by qu clicking on the green survey icon at the bottom of your screen. For the Q&A portion of the webinar, we will be joined by Tom Chen, PhD, Chief Scientific Officer at Universal Sequencing. The first question is for Alvaro and is about some of your samples. With some of the insects, especially the leafhopper or others, would holding them for a period of time to allow clearance of the gut or feeding them something like a defined solution allow clearance and diminish the potential contaminating material in your DNA prep? That's a great question. Um, yes, absolutely, yes. Um, that's one thing that can be done. Um, some of the insects, unless they are feeding, they die right away. So it's um, you really have to know about the biology of the insects in which ones you can you can starve for a while before you freeze them, but um, but yeah, that's something that we are going to look at, and, and yeah, it, it has come up, and absolutely, it can be done in some insects. How many different parts of a genome will bind to one bead? Is it possible to have parts of more different chromosomes barcoded from the same bead? So great question. Yes. So each bead, for example, in this large genome, you know, eukaryotic genomes, each bead will bind anywhere from four to eight um, genomic um, fragments. So those eight, four to eight genomic fragments will have the same barcode, but that's okay because because the genomes are really large, and the chances that two the same two regions in the genome will bind the same bead are very um, again, statistically very very low. So you know that these, these two fragments will have the same barcode, but they have a different sequence. So they belong in different regions of the, of the, of the genome. Um, the question is also important because previous libraries that, that were you know, similar to the, to the TELSIC libraries, they had, they had about 300 fragments that in, in each barcode beam. And these libraries have only four to eight fragments, so they have an extremely high definition of um, of you know of the in each one of the beams, but um, but yeah, the, the answer is about four to six in in eukaryotes. And if you go down to microbes, for example, where really I mean you have a, a very tiny genome, then it's, it's just one or two fragments of DNA that, that bind the tail beads. And you do that by just by the dilution and the the ratio of DNA to beads um, when you start the uh, the, the protocol. Thanks. 
How amenable is TelSeq to mammalian or human samples, including human samples? Yeah, so for human samples, then the paper that I showed, that the, the first paper that, that they published, it shows an um, assembly of, of human um, um, human uh, genomes. And I think, you know, most of these um, um, uh, long read, um, link long read technologies, they, they are really great for, for or human, you know, cow, all mammals that have much simpler genomes. I think um, I think that they are a really great um, alternative for 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 mammalian genomes. Um, in plants, you know, when you go to plants and you start dealing with polyploidy and you start dealing with uh, extremely long repeats or something, then then they are still perfectly fine to use for scaffolding. But to use them only for the novel assembly, you you might might run into problems. But, um, but I think for, for easy genomes, as mammalian genomes, um, um, they can be even used for assembly just by themselves. What is the largest genome that you attempted to do a de novo assembly for using only TelSeq libraries? Um, no, only TelSeq libraries was that one, the, the, the ugly. Um, but but it was you know it was an extremely complicated genome that had so many so many other things that it was never going to assemble. But other than the melon that was 400 megabases, we haven't because because it's not our objective. Our objective is um, you know if we have plenty of DNA, we will do pack bio and and then use the tel the, 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 the strength of the tel seek for the um, for the estimation of genome size, for the scaffolding, and for the gap filling. Uh, can TelSeq libraries be sequenced with two by 250 reads? And is there an advantage of using longer reads? So they definitely can. Um, for example, if you are going to use it for the Nova assembly, Supernova, Supernova, I believe that it only takes uh, two by 250 reads. So even if you import the two by 250, um, it will clean them to two by 150. However, for scaffolding, all those you know, the, the uh, arcs and links, for example, they are designed for even for very long reads for you know for bio reads. So yes, definitely you can use two by two fifty. And there could be some advantages, you know, any region of low diversity or something, you know, having longer reads will be will be an advantage. The reason why we haven't tried it is that we want to keep sequencing costs as low as possible. And when you look at um, um, sequencing two by one fifty in the Novastic and sequencing two by two fifty. The two by two fifty is comparatively much more expensive than the two by one fifty. So we have only done one two by one fifty, but I I think for for scaffolding definitely you can do two by two fifty. How does TelSeq work for sequencing mitochondrial DNA, and is it possible to reconstruct mitochondria from the DNA isolates? I would probably say, um, um, give that that question to Tom because um, we haven't um, um, gone to to such small genome. You know, I suppose if you can really purify, um, you know, mitochondrial genome without any nuclear DNA, and um, I don't know if you can with a TLC go to to such low um, uh, genome about 16 kb or so. Sure. L let me check in. Uh, yeah, uh, again, we not uh, intentionally to sequence mitochondria DNA or sequence uh, directly, but based on the overall the whole genome sequencing, we do see the, uh, there's good coverage on the mitochondria DNA. And uh, so, yeah, it's a, in principle, it depends on what's your purpose. Um, for sure, we know it's, uh, the mitochondria DNA is covered. Uh, however, if you have a way to specifically identify and isolate the mitochondria DNA, yeah, we, we definitely also can sequence. But overall, so far, we only, at this whole genome level, uh, we, we, we do see there's a pretty good coverage on the mitochondria DNA. Yeah, and also in our assemblies, for example, we were able to identify, you know, which, I mean, in the most of them, which, um, which of the scaffolds were from mitochondria. Um, and so, and based on that, we were able to reclassify one of the insects. We thought it was one species, but based on the mitochondria, we had to, to reclassify it. So if you sequence whole genome, um, you know, whole genome DNA, you will get also the mitochondrial genome. This is another 
Question for Alvaro. What was the total sequencing cost per insect? Yeah, so for this pilot project, um, we spent anywhere from some sequencing cost plus bioinformatics and, and everything. It was uh, between um, three to five thousand dollars per per insect. Um, yeah, that's what it was. Can you use Telsic read? I think you got cut off. I don't. I didn't. Yeah. I'll say it again. Can you use Telseq reads to polish an assembly? So, for example, in the assemblies that we had that were based on on Pack Bio, the assemblies are phased. Um, so, if you use shotgun reads to to polish the assembly, um, you will remove that phasing. And um, the Pack Bio reads are already high accuracy. So there is no need to to polish a, a pack bio assembly with short reads. We can definitely use the Telsic, and that's what we did for filling the gaps right in between in between the contexts. Um, you can definitely use the Telsic to polish an assembly that is based on box for nanopore and and and, and on pack bio CLR. So that's that's a major advantage. You know, you 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 make one type of library, just the Telsic, to do scaffolding. To do polishing and to do gap filling, but um, but a pack bio high file library you don't want to 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 polish with short reads. You can polish with long reads, um, with the reads themselves, but not with short reads. Do you think Telsi could be used in combination with target enrichment sequencing? I would have to know what's the um, you know the. What what was behind that question? I don't think I I, I follow it completely. Yes. Um, yes. So so maybe let, let me chip in. So, yes, we actually we do have the procedure for targeted uh, so sequencing. It uh, depends which way you refer to. So we have the a way so we can enrich non contiguous target region. Uh, for example, is uh, uh, over twenty kb, even hundred kb. And then because the yield the enrichment yields will be low, that will actually perfect fit into the tail seek procedure. We can use as low as 0.1 nanogram uh, to making the, the tail seek library uh, for the targeted sequencing. Uh, one of our audience members notes that some core facilities may be hesitant to try a new sequencing primer or may not have enough um, clients to fill a whole flow cell for Telseq um, and ask, is it offered as a service? Definitely, yes, absolutely. And, and, and we have done, you know, we, we do the Nova assembly for people from all over the world. And, uh, and in many of our assemblies, we have included Telseq. So we offer the entire service. And if you just want us to make the Telseq libraries, we can also um, just make those, as long as the DNA really meets the requirements and is clean and is long and we can make the libraries. All right. Well, that's all the time we have for today. We'd like to thank Alvaro Hernandez, Tom Chen, and our sponsor, Illumina. If we didn't have time to get to your question, we will try to follow up with our expert. As a reminder, please look for the survey after you log out to provide your feedback. Thank you. Thank you very much for listening. Thank you.